Okay, good. All right, sorry. There's a few things we need to know uh, before we get into how to do proofs. Um, so generally, we've already done some logic proofs, and we want to be able to prove some things true for different kinds of numbers. And we have a few techniques to do it, but we need to know um, some more complex operations. And it looks like I need to focus this. Okay, so we need to do modulus, um, some summations and related notations, and uh, a little bit on subscripts. So we mentioned modulus in class before, and modulus is an operator that we use in computer science all the time. And the way we write it, it is A mod B. Does anybody know any other way to write it? Percent sign, so we also can write this, but we only usually do that on the computer, not on a piece of paper. Okay, and then we have this funny symbol that math books usually use that means the same as equals. So if I say A mod B is equal to C mod B, I might actually not even write the mod B part, so it might be in parentheses. So I might just have this congruent sign. So this triple sign right here means is congruent to. And it's almost like, you know, when we have a log and then we write a little number at the bottom of it, it means that that's a different base. This triple equals is like an equals as long as I assume the mod operator. So it is an equals, but it's like an equals with a mod subscript. But we don't put subscripts on operators, so that's why we have a new operator. Okay? But it's equal as long as we do mod with the same uh, base. So what does that actually mean? So 1 mod 3, what actually mod means is you divide the first number by the second number. So A mod B is A divided by B. And it's going to give me the remainder of that. So A mod B is the remainder portion of A over B. So whatever the integer is, we don't care. And we just care about what the remainder is. And it's not a fraction, it's a whole number. So A and B have to be what kind of numbers? They need to be integers. It doesn't make sense in any other, any other thing. So they have to be integers. So A and B are definitely integers. So that's how we write that. They're in the integers. And A mod B is in the integers too. Okay, so 1 mod 3 is equal to what? 1 mod 3. If I divide 1 by 3, what's the remainder? It is 0 with a remainder of 1, and so the mod is 1. Okay, so how about 4 mod 3? It's also 1. So that's what we use this triple equals for. So equals is reserved for things that are actually equal, but this congruent to is if we use the same mod, then they're the same. They actually reduce down to the same thing. Yes, that is integer z. Sorry, if you were looking while I wrote it, it was probably easier. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's just a, it's just a z. All right, so let's look at um, some numbers. So before we actually mentioned uh, what we use mod for, the thing we use it most frequently for is
What do we use mod for? Uh, to tell if things are odd or even. To move through an array, row by row. To see if a division is even. I'm doing it right now, looking at something on the wall. Telling time. Yes, people use mod all the time to figure out what time it's going to be after an hour. Right? I don't just add 60 to the number of minutes and that's the new time, is it? No. How do I figure out the time an hour from now? You can add one to the hour. How do I figure out the time 90 minutes from now? I can add one to the hour and 30 minutes to the minutes, but what's going to happen? What could happen? Can the minutes be larger than 60? Yes. And if they are 60, what should I do? Should we start over today, like reset the brain buttons? Like, you guys do this all the time. It's not hard. You just take mod 60. So you just take the number of minutes, mod 60, and then we add the integer part to the hours, right? So we take the current time. We have hours and minutes. We just add the minutes we want right here to this one, and we get a new number. So let's say right now it's not a good time to add anything to. Um, but let's say we're going to do 90 minutes from now. So it's 4.01, and we're going to do 90 minutes from now. So we're going to add that. It will be 91. So I do mod 60 on that. What is it? It's 31. And then what do I do to the hours? I add 1, which was the integer part of dividing 91 by 60. That's how I get the new time. What else do you do to get, if I was going to try to get 90 minutes from now? I actually, sometimes I just look at the clock and I see where an hour goes, right? Because it just moves one hand up. And then I go 30 more minutes. But you're still doing mod that way. Because what the clock has done is actually made a circle out of 60 minutes. And so when I go around once, that's chopping off a 60. That's chopping off one of the integer parts of dividing by 60. So every time you do that, you're actually doing one of the parts of the integer division. Right? Because when we divide something by something else, we're actually counting how many times it can be done inside there. Okay, so you had some other examples, right? So for um, going by rows in an array. So let's say I have an array in a program. And I really want a 2D array, but I don't actually have them implemented in the language that I'm using. So what I do is I decide how many columns I want, and then I do a mod to figure out which column I should be in. Okay, so let's actually do this example. Let's say I want three columns in my array. And just because I feel like it, we're going to start at 1, even though a lot of languages start at 0. OK, so this is going to be my array. And my indices go from 1 to 15. And let's say I want to use this to implement a three-column an array that's 2D that has some number of rows and three columns. First of all, how many rows does it actually have? Well, it's one row. But if I want it to be 2D and I have three columns, how many rows will I have just based on this picture? We'll have five. Okay? So how do I do it? I would like you to figure out with your neighbor how we do it, and then we will get back together and talk about it. Okay, so we are given some linear space in memory. This is how computers actually work. 
except we address all of our memory linearly. We also will put it in pages, so it actually is in blocks, 2D blocks, but we often address them linearly. And we need to figure out, if I want to use something as a 2D array, I have to figure out how to index into it. OK? Index into it means figure out a number that I feed to the array to put me at the address I want to be at. OK? So how the first thing you have to do is figure out how this is going to be stored. Like, if I have a 2D grid of stuff, what am I, where am I going to put what? So let's say this is my 2D grid. OK, that's all that will fit in my array. So I want you to figure out how you're going to put it into your array. Do that quickly, and then we'll get back together. OK, there are two different ways that I might store this data in a linear array. What are the two different ways? Does anybody know the actual technical names for them? Does anyone know the technical names for the two different ways to store this data in a linear array? Row major or column major? Which one did you do? What does row major mean? Go across the row first. What does column major mean? Go down the column first. So did you do row major? Raise your hand. Did you do column major? Raise your hand. OK, good, because we do row major almost always. So you should do row major because row always comes first in all kinds of math. So we always do the rows first just to be consistent. So what we did is we stored A, B, C, and then D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. OK? So now let's see if I want to get to element 2, comma 1. Which element is that in this matrix? So this is a row by column array. I want to get element 2, comma 1. First of all, what letter is that element 2, comma 1? OK, I heard a D and I heard a B. How many people think D? OK, how many people think B? How come people aren't here are voting over here? OK, try again. How many people think D? How many people think B? OK, so those of you who picked row major also should have picked D, because we do row first, row two, column one. There it is. So it is D, because we go to row two, look in column one. So if I tell you, OK, I've stored this in this array, how would I tell you to go to element two, one? We know we're going row major, so to get to element 2, 1, I have to go all the way through row, row 1 first, right? And how many items are on row 1? Three. So I'm going to have to go through three items before I can get to row 2, right? So what I can do is I can take my current location in here. So 4, if I take that mod 3, what is the result? It's 1. So that tells me what column I'm in. OK, how do I figure out what row I'm in? That's the integer part of the address over 3. Except we do what? We round up if the remainder is bigger than 0, right? We actually round up always because we started at row 1. So. Let's, let's try this. So if I take the integer part of 1 over 3, what do I get for the row number? It's 0, but we add 1 to it, right? OK, so it should be row 1. And then what is the remainder of 1 over 3? 1. So this should be 1, 1 in the array. That's good, because that's what it is, right? How about the second one? The integer part is 0. We add 1 to it to get row 1. And then the mod part is 2. So we get column 2, right? That's good, because that's element 1, 2. So I'm in row 1, go to element 2. 
This is a super important skill. So you need to be able to do modulus. It's the easiest way to do any of this stuff. So um, we'll figure out the column number for an array if we actually do that. So um, how about tell me how to get to, so if I'm from here and I want to figure out where in the location in my array to store um, the 3-3 three, three element, how do I map that address? What do I do with the row 3? Subtract 1 from it, multiply it by 3. Okay, and then I have to add something to it. I add the column to it, right? Okay, so let's find out what that is. That's 2 times 3, which is 6 plus 3 equals 9. Does that give me the right thing? Yes, it does. So this is a super important skill because we do this all the time. We almost all the time have to store things of a certain size, and they almost never match the way that my memory in my computer is. So either the memory in my computer might be like way wider than what I want to have, or it might be way shorter. You know, there's a lot of different dimensions. It can be different. So I'm going to have to be able to map where I'm storing things to what I actually have on the computer. Can you think of any other thing we might use this for? Use this or modulus. So if I want to export a spreadsheet into a file, does a spread does a file like a text file have columns in it? No, what do I do? I can separate elements by spaces or some other delimiter, but then if I want to import it back in, I can do by delimiter, or I could do by fixed width. That's the other option you get when you're like importing or exporting files from Excel. So fixed width is exactly what we just did. So this is the calculation that Excel does when it's doing a fixed width, width import or export. What does it assume about rows and columns? So rows are going to be what in your text file? What are they separated by? What do files have in them? They have characters in them. And when we display them, we usually display them how? Row by row, yes, so we normally have end of line characters and we do one line at a time. So normally rows are stored in lines in text files. Okay, so they're normally stored in lines and we have a delimiter at the end which is an invisible character that says end of line or carriage return. Okay, so when I'm doing fixed width, looks for that for the end of line and goes to the next row. But if we're just doing in a linear list, we actually have to look for getting to when mod equals zero, right? So when my, when my remainder is zero, so three mod three is zero, that is the end of my row. I need to start a new row. So this is column one. So here's something interesting. It repeats. This is column one, row one, column one, column two, column three. Row two, column one, right? Row two, column two. Row two, column three. Row three, column one. Row 3, column 2, row 3, column 3. So if a number has a 0, like if I take mod 3 and the number is equivalent or congruent to 0 mod 3, what does that mean about the number? If it has a remainder of 0 when I divide by 3, what is true about that number? It is a multiple of 3, or it is 0. Right, because we don't normally say zero is a multiple of three, although technically it is. We just don't normally say that. Um, so every number that's going to have a zero modulus a certain value is div div divisible by that value. So this is a definition that we need to know.
So we say A is divisible by B. We also say that B divides A. We can also say that A is a multiple of B. And we can also say that B is a factor of A. All of those are equivalent. So if I were to write an equation, A equals something, what do I put on the right? Given that A mod B is 0, what can I put on the right? B times something. Okay, and how do I write, how do I denote a something? I use a variable. That's what we learned in predicate calculus, right? And in logic, we use letters for stuff. And what kind of something is it? It's an integer. So these are all equivalent statements. If A mod B is 0, then A is divisible by B, B divides A, A is a multiple of B, B is a factor of A, and also A is equal to B times K, where K is an integer. Any questions about that? Okay, well, let, what, how about if we say A mod B is equal to 1? Can you write an equation with A and B in it? That would be true? What equation can we write with A in terms of B? I don't want any mods in the equation. A equals BK plus 1. And K still is in the integers, right? Okay, this has to be the case. So by the definition of divisibility, if something has a modulus 1, that means when I divided them, I had a leftover of 1. That meant that I had some multiple of the divisor, which is B, so that's KB, plus I had one left over. So the actual definition tells you that. Okay, so just by analogy, if I say A equals, sorry, A mod B equals C, then the general equation I can write is what? A equals BK plus C. I have a question. How many different unique C's are there for a fixed B, A, and B? Okay, I heard B minus 1. Any other possible answers? Okay, B. Any other answers? No. Who would like to vote for B minus 1? Who would like to vote for B? Good, B is the right answer. Why is it B? Because we have to count 0. Because we actually don't use B as a value, so if we did, it would be 1 up to B. We could use it, so the, mo the possible values for C... It has to be 0, 1, 2, 3, comma, dot, 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 all the way up to B. And the number, sorry, B minus 1. If I start at 0, I have to go to B minus 1, because if I add, had B on there, it's equivalent to 0, right? So I don't want to repeat my mod values. Okay, now I have a question for you. If I think about all the integers, and I pick a value B, let's say, Three, since we were using it before. Is there a number that I cannot represent in this form? Is there an integer that I cannot represent in this form? Yeah.
Yeah, including negative numbers. How many people think that we can represent every number with, in a formula like 3 times k plus c, where c is a number between 0 and 2? Okay, two people believe in math. Any number. Can I write every number in a formula like this? All the integers. Can I write all integers like this? As a multiple of something times 3 plus some other number? Yes, right? I mean, I could just take any old number, right? Subtract whatever C is from it. Divide by 3. Or divide by 3 and figure out what C is. So all numbers can be written. No matter what the mod, val mod value is, all numbers can be represented in the form in A equals BK plus C for a given A and B. I mean, so A, all numbers A, so A is a number that we're representing um, for a given mod value B. So what that means is every number I should be able to tell you what the mod value is. If I give you a base, you can tell me what the mod value is. That's good because we need that. Right? Like if, I, if there were some numbers I couldn't do that with, I couldn't actually figure out what time it would be 90 minutes from now sometimes. Right? Because I'd have to skip over some numbers and I wouldn't know what to do. So we like numbers because they're, they're reliable and they do what they're supposed to all the time and we don't skip over any of them before we go to something else. So this is a property of the numbers. So it's a property of the mod operator actually that it can partition all of the numbers. So modulus is what we call an equivalence relation. So what that means is, and it's on the integers, by the way. It's not defined for anything else. That is how I write my z's. So it's an equivalence relation on the integers. And what that means is it separates them into classes where everything in the class is considered to be equivalent. So let's go back to three. Actually, well, we'll do three and then we'll do two. So let's go back to three. So we have, we can write any number like this, and C is, is in the set 0, 1, 2, right? And B equals 3, so we're going to have A equals BK plus 0, or BK plus 1, or BK plus 2. So that curly brace means an OR. It's one of these things, one of the rows. So it's either the first row, the second row, or the third row. Every single number can be written with one of these three formulas because those are all the possible mod values if I divide by 3. So these are actually what I would call like the representative numbers. So I would say 0. Zero can represent everything that is divisible by three, right? It might actually be better to use three to represent that because then you can remember that everything's divisible by three because it'll help you remember which was the number you divided by. So you could instead use one, two, and three, um, but it's either one you can do. So that is your choice if you want to do that. So normally we would actually say, okay, um, we can divide the numbers into the ones that are divisible by three, the ones that are divisible by 3 if you subtract 1 from them, and the ones that are divisible by 3 if you subtract 2 from them. Those are the possible orientations of the corners of what? Of a Rubik's Cube? Very cool. So 
That's something new that I hadn't even thought of. I don't know how to solve a Rubik's Cube. I wish I did, but I've never spent enough time to figure it out. Okay, so why do we care? I know you don't care. Okay, but you will care because it's going to be on your homework. Okay, also it's really important to know, like, that I can actually separate things into categories. Why, do I, why would I want to separate numbers? For example, why do I separate numbers into even and odd? What are, what are even and odd? What are they? They are the equivalence classes defined by doing the mod 2 operation. Right? So if I take numbers and I do mod 2 on them, the remainders I get are 0 and 1. So the numbers that have a remainder of 0 are the evens, and the numbers that have a remainder of 1 are odds. So if I ask you, is the product of an even number with an odd number odd, can you answer that question? Okay, what is the answer? The answer is no. Can you prove it? How would you prove it? Pick any two numbers and multiply them. Multiply all of them. Okay, that's a good idea. Right? We take all the possible even numbers and all the possible odd numbers and we multiply them. You let me know when you're done with that. Yes. Okay. We pick a number and we multiply it by 2. That's an even number. And we pick another number. Okay, so, but how can I make sure that the other number is odd? That's definitely odd, right? If I write a formula two times an integer and I add one to it, that is odd. That is the definition of odd. You might have thought odd meant something else, but it actually means that if I divide by two, I'll have a remainder of one, which is equivalent to saying that it can be written as two times an integer times plus one. Okay, so now I have, this is an arbitrary even number, right? Every even number can be written like that. We just showed that. We just talked about it. We didn't actually show it, but it's fine. We're not going to do that. And every single odd number can be written this way. So now we've actually gotten a representation that will do what you said, which is we're going to write something that's going to work for all the numbers, thanks to your variable representation. Okay, so we're going to say 2x times 2y plus 1. And then we're going to multiply that out. We get 4xy plus 2x. Now, in order to say that this is even, I have to show that I can factor out a 2 and have an integer left, right? That's actually what I have to do. There's two different ways I could do it. The first way is to actually factor out a 2. And by definition, this is divisible by 2 because I've just factored it. And what? x, y, and x are all integers, and the integers are closed under multiplication and addition. And I know you don't care about that. But what that says is if I do 2xy plus x, it's going to still be an integer. I can't possibly get some irrational number or some kind of like decimal, you know, real number. I'm going to get an integer back. So this is now divisible by, so therefore, so we use this little symbol with three dots for therefore. Um, therefore, the product of an odd and an even is even. 
So the reason is that we factored out a 2. And integers are closed under multiplication and addition. So we're not going to be as formal with the proofs for arithmetic stuff as we were with the logic because we're not doing really complicated things. As long as you've got something that I can read and make sense out of, it's going to be fine. However, there is one mistake that lots of people make on this problem, which is that they use the same variable for the second one. So we've implicitly used a quantifier here. We've used, what, what quantifier am I trying to use? For all, right? And I want these to be different because if they're not, they need, they need to have quantifiers in between them. So I'm going to use an implied quantifier. We're not actually writing down the quantifiers when we do arithmetic proofs. But what we really mean is for all x and for all y, where x and y are in the integers, that 2x is now always even, 2y plus 1 is always odd. So a typical problem here is that people use the same letter for the even and odd number. And what happens if I use the same letter for the even and the odd number? It's not wrong. It will prove something different. What will it prove? It will prove that two consecutive numbers multiplied together will always be even. Right? So all consecutive numbers can be represented by 2x and 2x plus 1. Right? But those are consecutive. So if x is the same in both of those, which it is, because if I don't write a quantifier, I only get to have one for the same letter. So this would be, if I used those and then I multiplied them and did the same proof, I'd only be proving that two consecutive integers multiplied together are going to be even. So don't use the same letter for two different numbers. Okay, any questions about that? So you have problems like this on homework five, which is basically, which of the following is a good proof that the product of an even and an odd integer is a valid proof? And you have to pick the one that looks closest to this. Okay, so we usually do harder problems than that for our arithmetic proofs. So let me give you one. Okay, might be shocking, but n cubed minus n squared is always divisible by 3. So we want to prove this. What do we do? We make a truth table. But in our truth table, instead of writing down all the possible values of all the possible numbers, n, we're going to write down all the equivalence classes if we divide the number by 3. So for n, we're going to write down 3k, 3k plus 1, and 3k plus 2. And then we're going to find out what n cubed minus n squared does for each of those. So I'd like you to try that on your paper, multiply out, Plug in 3k for each of these terms, and 3k plus 1 for each of those, and 3k plus 2 for each of those, and see if you can prove that each one of those ends up so that you can factor out a 3 out the front. Okay, I heard one shortcut. 
Um, sorry, there's a correction to the problem. It should have been n cubed minus n. Okay, so in the first one, I can obviously factor out a 3, right? If it's not so obvious, you can still multiply it out. So I can get 27k cubed minus 3k equals 3 times 9k cubed minus k. And that is clearly divisible by 3, right? Okay, on the second one, who came up with a clever trick? Yes? You can factor out an n. Okay, so what do I get when I factor out an n? n squared minus 1. Anybody know some more factoring you can do? n squared minus 1 is equal to n plus 1 times n minus 1. Okay, now when I'm plugging in my 3k or 3k plus 1 or 3k plus 2 for n, I don't have to do it all the time. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that I can sometimes leave some ends in there. Okay, so I want to do n cubed minus n for 3k plus 1. So n is going to be 3k plus 1. And I have that this is actually the same as n times n plus 1 times n minus 1. And my goal is to get a 3 that I can factor out to the front. So which of the following of these can I plug 3k plus 1 into and get a 3? n minus 1. So I can do n times n plus 1 times 3k plus 1 minus 1. And those cross out, and I get a 3, which is already a factor. Right? And I didn't have to cube anything or even multiply anything. I just had to do a factoring. Okay, so same thing for 3k plus 2. Which one of those can I put 3k plus 2 into and get a 3 out? n plus 1. So I can put n times 3k plus 3 <coughs> times n minus 1, and I can factor a 3 out of that, right? And that's clearly multiply. That's clearly divisible by 3. There's one other rule that we need to know for divisibility so that you can look at these and tell if they're divisible by 3. So we have two different ways of checking if a sum is divisible by b. So either all the terms in the sum are divisible by b, in which case I could factor them out, right? Or I can actually just factor out b. Either one of them I can show. So in other words, I can actually just say that 3k squared plus 6k plus 2, well, no, let's say plus, plus 12, each one of those is divisible by 3, so the sum must be divisible by 3, right? So I don't have to, like, factor it out. That's an extra step that's not really necessary. So if on your paper you put little checks under the numbers, that'll be fine. As long as there's a check under everything, the entire sum can be thought of as being divisible by your mod value. So I, alternatively, I could have factored out a 3 and shown that this is you know, one of the factors is 3, so that's the other way to show something's divisible. How about showing that something's not divisible by 3 or some other number? I'm talking about a sum. So how about 3k plus 1? Is that divisible by 3? How many people think yes? How many people think no? Good. 3k plus 1 is not divisible by 3, right? 
We've already used that as a representation of something that has a remainder of 1 if you divide by 3. Automatically not divisible by 3 because you have to have a remainder of 0 when you divide by 3. So we already know that there's at least one example of a sum that we actually know whether it's divisible by 3 or not. How about this one? Is this divisible by 3? No? How do I know that? Because this number is divisible by 3, right? The sum of the first two terms. And that's basically logically equivalent to the first one, which is something multiplied by 3 plus something that isn't divisible by 3. So we actually know that a number is not divisible by a factor if it can be written as that factor times an integer plus something that's not divisible by that. So if we have... So basically, if I have a check under one term and an x under the other, 4 dividing by b, then we're going to know that this is not divisible by b. And your example you can remember for that is 3k plus 1 or 3k plus 2. Both of those are not divisible by 3. But how about if I have something like this? 9k squared plus 4k plus 2. So we have one divisible term and two not divisible terms. Do we know whether that is divisible by 3 or not? It might be, but it might not be, right? So one example is if k is equal to 1, then this is divisible by 3, right? Because if k equals 1, I still don't care what this is, but that would be 4 plus 2, which is 6 which is divisible by 3, if k equals 2, what would I get? I'd get non-k squared plus 10, right? But 10 is not divisible by 3, so that would not be divisible by 3. So the answer is here that we actually can't tell. So your goal is, if you want to show that something is not divisible by 3, you want checks under everything in a sum except 1x. Okay, so all of the terms but 1 must be divisible by your divisor. So therefore, a number is not divisible by b if every term by but 1 in the sum is divisible by b. And exactly one of them has to be not divisible by b. Any questions? Okay, last time we talked about rational numbers and we gave a definition. So rational numbers are integers, sorry, ratios of integers. So if you're in the rational numbers, which we usually represent with an R, that's the set of elements that look like P over Q, where P and Q are in the integers. And we sometimes assume that P and Q are relatively prime. Um, just what does relatively prime mean? That means they don't have any common factors. And why do we do that? Why do we usually say that? It's because we have a lot of representations of the same fraction otherwise, right? So I could write 1 as 
2 over 2 and 3 over 3 and 4 over 4, and I don't want to have a whole bunch of those in there, so that's why we normally do that. Okay, so do you guys know of any numbers that are irrational? E, square root of 2, pi. Okay, has anybody ever proven that a number is irrational? So how would we prove that a number is irrational? Okay, so before you wanted us to try everything, you don't want us to try everything this time? Well, we, we could, like, try all the pairs of numbers, right, and, and look to see if it was equal to any of those. But that would take forever, and you're still working on the last pro- That's why you're still working on the last problem. Okay, that's good. So actually, we should actually do what? We should assume that it's rational and then try to get a contradiction. So we should try a proof by contradiction. So if a proof, a direct proof, would require us to do something that will take infinitely long, we don't do that. We figure out another way. So if I want to prove that a number, so let's say we want to prove square root of 2, is irrational. So we need to do it by contradiction. So the first thing we do in a proof by contradiction is do what? We write down the negation of the conclusion. So we're going to do statements and reasons like we have in the past. And by the way, you will never have points taken off for making something prettier than I do it. Okay, so our first step is going to be the negation of the conclusion. So then what we need to do is we need to write what that actually tells us. So let's remember for a second, I know it's painful, but we're going to remember for a second learning proofs. And by the way, you guys did amazing learning proofs. So you did a great job on the test. Congratulations. So hopefully this next part won't be too bad. So when we do proofs, we don't actually know what we're going to do to get there. We just come up with an idea and we start moving in that direction. And that's why people hate them so much, because you don't actually know exactly what you're going to do. You just try to look for patterns and try to get the variables that you want. So here, what we want to do is we need to find a contradiction. That is the definition of proof by contradiction. I write down the negation, the conclusion. And then I need to derive stuff until I derive one thing and something else that's the opposite of that thing. OK? So I need to start writing some stuff down. And I can only write down things that I know. So if square root of 2 is rational, what do I know? I can write it as p over q, where p and q are integers, and p and q are relatively prime. In other words, they have no common factors. So this is by definition of a rational number. And then the next thing we do is go, hmm, that didn't tell me very much. And I don't like equations with square roots in them, because we know we get irrational stuff, but we're not going to say that. We just want to square both sides to get rid of them. And we also want to cross multiply, because we also don't like fractions. Okay, so let's square both sides and cross multiply to get 2q squared equals p squared. And that's just regular arithmetic. And that can be a reason, by the way. So we, we squared both sides and we cross multiplied with q squared. Now, we just looked at divisibility. So now that I can write p squared in terms of 2 and something else, then p squared must be divisible by what? q squared and 2. 
I prefer to know things about concrete numbers than things about other variables. So let's actually write down that 2 divides p squared. And that's from line 3. And actually, that came from line 2. So from the definition of divisibility, if I can write a number as a product, and then it's divisible by all the terms in that product. Now, I might be getting something here because before I said something about common factors between P and Q. So now I might be able to get a factor for what? P. Right now I have a factor for P squared. So P squared is not the same as P, right? So I need to know that 2 is a factor of P. So I, what I would like is that if 2 divides P squared, then 2 should divide P. Okay, I just made a wish, and we're going to call this a lemma, and we're going to prove it to the side. But let's just assume that that works. By the way, you do have to prove this. We'll have a question like this on your homework and on your tests that you actually have to prove that if a square of something is divisible by a number, then the actual number is divisible by that. Does anybody know a theorem that actually tells you that that is true? So every number, the theorem that tells you it's true is not what I'm going to let you use on proofs, but basically every number can be written as a product of primes, right? So I can't get a 2 out of a product of primes unless they came from the P to begin with, right? Unless 2 was actually rational, but it's not. So we're not going to use the product of primes argument. We're going to do a truth table proof of this to the side. So let's do it. So how do we do that? I'm going to make a column for p squared, a column for 2 divides p squared, a column for the implication, a column for 2 divides p, and a column for p. And then since we're divided by 2, we're going to divide the world of p's up into 2k and 2k plus 1. And then our divisibility statements are actually just propositions. It's either true or false that 2 divides p. In the first row, does 2 divide P? Yes, it does. In the second row, does 2 divide P? No, it does not. Okay. Now, in the first row, I have to figure out what P squared is in order to get 2 divides P squared. So that's going to be 4K squared. And the other one is going to be 4K squared plus 2K plus 1. And if you forgot how to do multiplication of polynomials, it's first, outer, inner, last. So we have 2k plus 1 times 2k plus 1. So first, outer, inner, last is 2k times 2k. Outer, 2k times 1. Inner, 2k times 1. Last is 1 times 1. And then you add all this. So actually I messed up, right? 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. That's a 4. There we go. Now, this is divisible by 2, right? 4k squared is divisible by 2, so we put a 1 in our 2 divides p squared column. In 4k squared, that's divisible by 2. 4k is divisible by 2. 1 is not, so that is a little mini proof that this sum is not divisible by 2, right? So I put a 0 there. By the way, this is literally what I want you to write on your page. Literally little checks and x's. You can write more if you like. You can write sentences. So one of the problems with proofs for most students is they, they, they don't know what to write. It's like you know something, but you don't know what to write down. Just start writing down what you know. Okay? But you're allowed to assume that I know what this means. Okay? Now, this actually implication goes both ways, right? So if 2 divides P, then 2 is going to divide P squared. So it actually goes both ways, but we don't need it to go both ways. Now, we did this for a general letter, like any variable, so we can use it for any number that we want. Okay, so that's our lemma. Do we have any questions about the lemma? By the way, if you want to use a lemma, you just make it up and you go prove it on the side. Then you can use it in your proof. Just like in logic. If you prove something, you can use it.
All right, so we're going to go back to our proof that square root of 2 is irrational. So we actually now know that this implication is true because we proved it. So we'll see the side proof for that. And now by 4 and 5 and modus ponens, what do we get? 2 divides p. And if 2 divides p, I can write p equals what? I can write it's 2k because actually I know 2 divides p and the case that it is, it's divisible by 2, I can write it as 2 times an integer. So p equals 2k is what I'm going to write. So that's from line 6 and definition of divisibility. Now I'm just going to substitute back in into my equation on line 3. I'm going to put 2k in there. So therefore p squared is 4k squared. So we'll have 2q squared equals 4k squared. And then if we divide both sides by 2, we get q squared equals 2k squared. And this was by 7 and 3 in substitution. And then we did some arithmetic. That's why these are called arithmetic proofs. Because we have axioms that we use plus some definitions of divisibility and some plus some regular arithmetic. Okay, now, does this look like anything we saw before? It should look like another line of the proof to you. What line does it look like? This is going to be line 9, by the way, so we're just going to do, this will be 9. Sorry, I was just running out of room. That's line 9, and that's from 8 in arithmetic. Okay, it doesn't look like line 7. It looks like what? Line 3. So from line 3, we derived a whole bunch of stuff. Can we do the same stuff with line 9? We can because it was just letters. We didn't care what the specific numbers were. So we can use the same line of reasoning to show that Q must have a factor of 2. So let's do it. So we can write, not as is known line 10, because of definition of divisibility, 2 divides Q squared. That's what's from line 9 and definition of divisibility. And if 2 divides Q squared, well, we'd also like that if 2 divides Q squared, then 2 divides Q, right? That's also by our lemma because it's just a letter, so we've already proven it. And 12, 10 and 11 together with modus ponens will give me that 2 divides Q. And with 13, we know that 2 divides Q and we know that 2 divides P from lines 12 and 6 in conjunction. But that means that P and Q have a common factor, right? That's just 13 and the definition of a common factor. And this is a contradiction. Since we assumed P and Q have no common factors. So you'll have to do two kinds of arithmetic proofs. One is that I'll give you an expression and I'll ask you if it's divisible by 3 or 4 or 5. And you just have to do a truth table proof just like we did. Or I will ask you to show whether or not a square root of a number is irrational or not. What kind of numbers can you do this proof for? So let's say I just change the 2 to another number. What kind of numbers can I change it to? I uh, want some other words besides irrational. What numbers besides 2 can I put in there? Okay, integers. Can I put any integer in there and have this proof work? Okay. 
Even numbers. Okay, so let's look at these proof lines. All of these, like all of these were like regular logic except for what? Like regular math or regular logic except for what? The lemma, right? Like modus ponens, it's not, it doesn't matter what the letters are, right? The only thing in here that it matters what the numbers and letters are is the lemma. So let's look at the lemma. The lemma says that the number we're considering, so this is where this proof's going to break. So if I put 4 in there, is this proof going to work? If 4 divides p squared, does that mean that 4 divides p? No. Right? Because 4 is a perfect square. 4 can divide p squared and 2 can divide p, and 4 might not divide p. So if you have a perfect square, it's not going to work because a perfect square, square of a perfect square is the number. It's not going to work. So I want you to think about what kind of numbers does this work for. That's your homework. See you later.